some new information comes to light about the mysterious motive behind the German Wings plane crash. The co-pilot may have hidden an illness from his employers. Almost a month after it began, the strike at the University of Toronto is finally over. And Humber News gets exclusive access to look inside the new LRC building at Humber North Campus. Hi and welcome to Humber News. I'm Chantilly Post coming to you from our newsroom here at Humber College North Campus. We have breaking news this hour. Two people have been killed in a construction accident near High Park. It has been reported that scaffolding collapsed around a condo site at Bloor Street near Pacific Avenue. The swing stage the workers were on came down around 11 o'clock this morning. One worker died at the scene while the other died on the route to the hospital. Traffic in the area on Bloor Street just north of High Park has been blocked off. And an update on the fatal crash in the French Alps, the co-pilot who investigators say intentionally crashed the Great German Wings flight is said to have been hiding a mental illness. Investigators searched Andreas Lupet's home yesterday and found medical documents that indicate he had an existing illness. They say they found torn up sick notes, including one from the day of the crash. The findings support the theory that Lupet's hid his illness from his employers and colleagues. Investigators say he received psychiatric treatment for a serious depressive episode, but once he continued training, he passed all medical tests. Meanwhile, the recovery operation is into the third day at the crash site. Workers are combing through the debris left after the plane slammed into the mountain. The wreckage covers one and a half hectares. All 150 people on board were killed. Saudi Arabian warplanes are targeting Yemen again today, and the country's president has fled to safety. It's the second day of airstrikes. Today's strikes hit two military bases in the area. Rebels responded with heavy anti-fire that could be heard across the city. The airstrikes mark a major escalation in the crisis in Yemen that has sparked stability concerns for the region. There is growing support for ISIS in, in Yemen, where fundamentally the Yemeni people don't support radical Islam. Um, so Yemenis themselves are wrestling with the idea that ISIS could gain a foothold in their country. There are concerns the conflict could develop into a proxy war between Iran and the U.S. Iran has allied itself with the rebels while the U.S. supports the Saudi-led strikes. Nuclear talks in Switzerland have entered their second day as world powers work to secure a deal with Iran. The talks are looking to curb its nuclear program for at least a decade in return for an end to crippling economic sanctions. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry took some time away from meetings today. Kerry walked the Swiss streets, talking with reporters and meeting with the public. The diplomatic push for a nuclear deal comes as the March 31st deadline for a tentative agreement looms. The agreement would lay the groundwork for a full deal to be signed by the end of June. A gas leak in the suspected, is a su suspected cause of an explosion and fire that injured 12 people in Manhattan. Three are in critical condition and two are still missing. More than 200 firefighters arrived on the scene yesterday afternoon. A huge fire broke out after an explosion in a five-story residential building on the Lower East Side. Mayor Bill de Blasio was on the scene with the New York City Fire Chief. Thank you, Mayor. And I would say it is a seventh alarm and there are approximately 250 of our members here on the scene. And our members arrived in less than three minutes to a, uh, a, a, a scene they certainly didn't expect. The scene of this explosion blew the front of 121 across the street. It is speculated that there was work being done on the gas lines in the building that may have not been up to code. Here at home, the Gian Gomeshi sexual assault case was back in court for a brief hearing today. The former CBC radio host is charged with seven counts of sexual assault and one charge of overcoming resistance by choking. His lawyers were in court to set a new date for a pre-trial hearing. That will take place on April 28th. Gomeshi was released on $100,000 bail last November and has pleaded not guilty to all charges. Classes are back to normal at U of T today after striking workers and the university agreed to binding arbitration. The teaching assistants walked off the job March 2nd after months of negotiations. Our reporter, Celia Grimley, has the details. Students are heading back to their labs and tutorials today after an agreement to enter arbitration and end the strike was reached last night. QP3902 Chief Negotiator Ryan Culpepper says he is happy with the campaign they ran. Right now the administration in Simcoe Hall is completely isolated. Students are supporting the union, faculty is supporting the union. That's going to continue with or without a strike. I think uh, the spotlight is on them. They're standing alone 
and uh, and people are going to demand change going forward. And I think uh, other labor unions and students and faculty are all uh, united in, in fighting for these changes. Support for the TAs was clear as students organized walkouts, demanding <laughs> refunds for missed classes, and professors offered lectures outside of class. But students say they are happy to go back to normal. I'm kind of relieved that the strike's over because it brings everything back to normal. All the assignments are going to start getting marked. That was like a big question. All my respect for the university and my professors just went really, really high because they tried so hard to make sure that we weren't affected. Culpepper says he is surprised that a deal will be made through arbitrations. We saw that as a concession on the part of the employer because they've said throughout the process that what we're bargaining over are for them fundamental matters of principle, fundamental sort of tenets of the management union relationship. And the fact that they're willing to put those before the arbitrator and roll the dice, I think, is a pretty big risk for them. The union and TAs are confident that they will get what they want through arbitration, but there is still work to be done as the members of QP 3902 head to York to support the TAs in their ongoing dispute. Celia Grimbley, Humber News. It's almost time to put away the power tools and hard hats because the Learning Resource Commons is getting ready for moving day. Humber News got a sneak peek today. Ainsley Smith has the story. The Learning Resource Commons is in its final stages of completion and it is almost ready to open its doors. The LRC will provide students an expanded library group and independent study spaces, a centralized hub for student services, a student gallery, and a showcase. The library will also include a new self-checkout, which will ensure faster circulation. There is also a number of seating areas for students to sit and relax or even take a nap. Students will be able to access the LRC from Humber's N, J, and H buildings. There is also a smoke-free courtyard between the N and J buildings, which will provide a link to the student center. The Guelph Humber building is only four stories, while the Learning Resource Commons stands at six, making it the biggest building on campus. The LRC building is almost near completion and Humber staff are expecting to move in by April 16th, which falls just before the official open house, which is April 18th. Ainsley Smith, Humber News. If you're up on the second floor of the L Wing today, chances are you couldn't walk past this display. Cute hand puppets, children's books, and a mouth-watering assortment of cookies and cupcakes. The event was organized by the ECE program as a fundraiser for its end-of-year social. The baking was all done by students in the program, and I can tell you, it helped fuel the work in the newsroom today. NASA is going to need more than just cupcakes to get its latest mission off the ground. The spacecraft rolled out to its launch pad set to take flight today from Kazakhstan. An astronaut from the U.S. and one from Russia will be spending a year on the International Space Station. The mission will help scientists gather data about the human body and how it reacts to long periods in space. Back down to Earth now. Earth Hour is tomorrow, a time when people around the world turn their lights off for an hour to help the environment. Carbon emissions are at unprecedented levels. We are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. The World Wildlife Federation started the Global Action in Sydney, Australia eight years ago. Since then, the event has expanded. Last year, 163 countries turned off their lights to do their part. 162 countries. I'm using my power to save the Great Barrier Reef. The Earth Hour website says it's a movement that has had an environmental impact around the world. When we come back, we'll tell you what's happening in the world of sports, and Shai Willinson will have your three-day forecast. It'll be pretty great today, so just try to remember that it is Friday. We'll have more, including your three-day forecast, coming up after the break. First, a baby orangutan is on the road to recovery after being held illegally as a pet. His name is Buddy. The International Animal Rescue found him trapped in a chicken cage last December. The 15-month-old was malnourished and his limbs were swollen and bent. But the baby is finally taking his final steps on his own after several months of intensive care. Buddy is gaining more strength and the animal shelter is preparing him for his release into the wild. <laughs> 